Hello, everybody. Welcome back to Research the Reader, day two. Really great to have you all here. Um, lovely to see you. Well, I wish I could see you, but I'll see you in the networking rooms in a, in a little while. So, um, in a few moments, we're going to start our first proper plenary session. I'm sure you're all looking forward to that. But before we do that, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to, to give you a few kind of uh, introductory messages. And mostly this is things that I think will be helpful to you that we've learned kind of in day one, which was kind of very experimental in many ways for a lot of us. So I want to just share with you a few things there that will help to make um, day two even better. Um, before I come on to that, just a couple of quick things, answering one, one or two questions. So one question that I have been asked is about recordings of the sessions. So as I said yesterday, this is all live. This is not you know, something you can rewind, um, but we will make recordings of the sessions available. So they'll be available on the platform in a few days time. Um, and it's gonna be uh, just sort of edited and put together correctly, take out all the square words, that sort of thing. And then they'll be available to you. We're also making slides available on the web site, I think, in, in a little while. Um, so let me talk a little bit about some things that have been going on. So uh, yesterday, lightning poster sessions were particularly successful. People really enjoyed that. I promised lightning poster speakers that they would have somewhere between one and 100 people in their session. I really couldn't predict what it was. Actually, it was pretty consistent around sort of 20, 30, 40 people joined each lightning poster. So they were pretty popular. So have a look at the schedule for those. And, uh, and do go along in the breaks if you want to pick up one of those one of those 10 minute sessions. Uh, the links are in the, uh, the session information. Um, networking rooms, again, very popular. So people found their way into those virtual spaces. I want to make a couple of suggestions about that. Well, one is um, when you get into those virtual spaces and you're talking to other people, I suggest you get really close to those other people, but huddle together. There's no social distancing in online, so you can really smoosh up against each other because then you'll be able to hear each other better and you won't kind of overhear people in other nearby groups so much. So I really encourage a kind of clumping together there. Um, if the room is a bit noisy or crowded, you can go to another room. You don't have to kind of go off on your own. You could be with a group of people. You could say, why don't we all go together now to the courtyard or somewhere and just, you know, click on that other room button and you'll all go over there and reconvene there. So give that a try. There are plenty of rooms that are quite fun to explore those. Um, please do visit these speakers. So some of the speakers will be making an appearance in the Great Hall in the break after their session. <coughs> Excuse me. And that um, is, a, is a good opportunity. You know, in physical conferences, the stage gets mobbed by people who want to go and argue with the speaker. So you should definitely be uh, looking to do that. Um, uh, when you, you get a chance in a, in a break. Um, also, there, there wasn't a lot of people in the networking rooms at lunchtime. Partly people were in lightning poster sessions, but I think people were away having some lunch. I'm going to set up a room in there that I'm going to call the lunch room or something like that, which is where you've got permission to talk to people while chewing. Okay, So if you're in your lunch room, then you can talk and network, but also it's for the good of all to be eating your lunch at the same time. We'll see whether that helps. Um, also, one thing that's going to go on in the networking rooms is that we're going to have some uh, Vox Pop filming. So anyone who's been to the previous r knows we try and do some little filming of people, ask them how they feel about the conference, that sort of thing. And so we're going to have someone, uh, Trushna is going to come around from the RSC and she's going to try and kind of capture people talking about the conference. Uh, she might also drop into the workshop sessions and try and capture a, a bit of that. So if she comes up to you and asks to film you, then of course, don't run away, but say yes, you'd love to do that. Thank you. Um, okay, Twitter, Twitter's been very active. Great, thank you for that. Please do use the hashtag um, r2rconf. Um, uh, that helps people find the tweets. So do keep up uh, tweeting uh, with quotes and comments and, and pictures of cake. Uh, that would be good. I think the top post at the moment is probably held by Rob's children, um, but also there's been some good uh, other posting about what's going on. I particularly like the Edge Sheds posting of that live video of, of uh, post-it notes being moved around on, on, on uh, Miro, uh, no, is it Miro? Anyway, one of those platforms. That was really exciting to see. So that's great stuff. So do go and have a look at Twitter when you get the chance. Um, okay, so good. Uh, what else do I need to talk about? I want to uh, mention, as always, the survey, super important to us. At previous conferences, most of you have actually filled in the survey, partly because we don't let you leave without actually handing out one over. It's a bit harder for us to do that here. So please do click on the survey link, which is now available in pretty much every session information box. 
When you click on that link, it'll open up the Survey Monkey survey. It's much easier to do it as you go along than to wait it to the end. So just click on the rating, maybe write a comment, that'd be great. You need to press next page if you want that to be saved. If you, you can leave it open all day, but if you want to be sure that what you've said is saved, you need to go on another page and then you can go back to the previous page. Uh, and when you're done, you can just be done. And don't worry if you do close the survey, just open up another one. You may get the, the, the survey you've been completing, or you may just get a blank survey. But if you get a blank survey, your old comments will have been saved if you press next. Um, but you can now just start making new comments and, and, and new, new uh, ratings of the next sessions. So if you find that you've actually completed four surveys, if, as long as you've not repeated yourself too much, that's just not a problem. But I would just click on it now, right now, open it up and keep it open uh, for the whole day. Uh, really valuable to get your feedback. Okay, what else do I want to talk about? Just a quick thing about sponsors. Um, I do like to give some kind of credit to our sponsors. Um, so they've been tremendously supportive of us. You can see them in the in the background here. Their logos are illustrated here. Um, I want to talk about Royal Society of Chemistry have been a fantastic supporter of us as a gold sponsor. Um, loving to have Asipon back. Asipon have sponsored us every year, so it's lovely to have them. Um, and uh, Wiley's made a new commitment. They have been a sponsor in the past, but this year they've stepped up the silver, given us a lot of support. They've provided a free ebook if you go to their exhibit area. Um, you can find a, a free ebook to download. It's a bit hard to find at the moment, and we're going to ask them to make it a bit easier to find. Um, so we'll figure out a way to do that. But that's well worth popping into. Trend MD, a very last minute uh, sponsor that came in last week. You can see them here. I had to have this backdrop reprinted. I printed it without them, and I had to spend a whole £19 getting a new backdrop just for them. So I'm very pleased to have them on board. Thank you very much for sponsoring as a silver sponsor. Bronze sponsors. Cargo Publishers, lovely to have another publisher as a sponsor as well. And um, Mosaic, which is my own company. This isn't actually my job doing this. This is just a hobby. I have a real job working as a recruiter with Mosaic and they're also a bronze sponsor. Also, thank you to Ringgold and Aries and EBSCO who are also sponsoring the event and also to our media partners, Research Information and Retraction Watch. So thank you to all of them. That's just been great to have them on board. So, Couple more things to say, and then we'll go straight on to the session. So, um, just a small thing I can announce now today that registrations for this year's R2R are higher than any previous R2R in the previous uh, five years. So that's pretty thrilling. And I know for a lot of online conferences, their registrations are up because they've kind of pivoted to an afternoon of webinars and gone free and that sort of stuff. But we're kind of doing this whole conference. And I want to really thank people for trusting us to deliver a, a real immersive online experience. Uh, it's been expensive to do, and therefore we've had to maintain the same prices for the same quality for the same cost. But it's just been really great to have you all on board. So thank you for that. Um, the last two registrations came in yesterday, so that's kind of thrilling to have people come in for walk-ins on the door, which is also what we had last year. So that's great. Thank you so much for that. Um, Production, so there's a lot of magic going on behind the scenes, and I kind of want to have a shout out to, to Claire and Steph and Henry and, and all the people at Gigabox and all the people at the Events Hub who've made this all happen. If you want to get a sense of what goes on behind the scenes, I have tweeted a link to a YouTube video from Broadcast News. And if you go to YouTube or you search Broadcast News um, tape, there's a, there's a moment about a tape there. If you watch that video sometime, you'll see what it's like. Uh, behind the scenes, it's a very good simulation of the last of our behind the scenes. So that's great. Right, okay, kind of the last thing I want to say, really, I think, is um, there's a very common complaint that we get at R2R, and I did want to address this. Um, people at R2R every year in the response forms, the survey forms, which I know you're already filling out right now, um, people always say that the room temperatures are either much too hot or much too cold. And I'm really sorry about that. So if right now you're experiencing a problem with your room temperature, it's too hot, too cold, then you should definitely not email us about that, but just go and adjust your own. Okay, good. So that's kind of me just about done. So I'm going to hand over now in a moment to Nico Gontorov, who's going to do another of his uh, China interviews, this time with uh, Professor Wu. So uh, I'm, I'm just going to uh, take a moment to just check that that's all ready to go. They're going to talk about um, scholarly communications in China. 
Um, and this is the second of a series of three um, interviews. Um, we had one yesterday and we're going to have uh, two today. So I'm sure you're all going to look forward to that. Um, and so I'm just about ready to hand that over and I'm waiting for a signal for Claire from Claire to let me know that it's okay and everyone's standing by and ready to go. And she says, yes, they are. So I'm going to hand over straight away now to Nico. Thank you very much, Mark. And good morning to everybody. Uh, good evening to um, Professor Wu Jinshan, who's kindly joining us from Beijing, um, where he's a professor at the School of System Science, as you will know from your bio. Um, I am very excited to, ha um, to have uh, Professor Wu here because he's, um, I, I think Professor Jinshan, you could speak about just about any topic that would be of interest to this audience, but um, I, I love the, I really love the, I think your description as a critical thinker is really accurate. Um, you take a, a unique view that opens up, I think, people's eyes to look at existing topics in a new way. And uh, today we're going to, we could, I mean, uh, honestly, um, Professor Wu understands bibliometrics. He understands a whole, journal rankings, all sorts of areas that would be of interest to this group. However, um, everybody is talking about STM publishing in China and research reforms in China. But at the heart of this lies higher education in China. And uh, what um, Professor Wu, or Jinshan, as I call him, because we've met and uh, we, we, we were going to go and um, go out and share a meal in Beijing, but the pandemic intervened and I didn't make it back, but we'll still be doing that. Uh, but higher education in China of course, is, is also looking at reform. And what Professor Wu is going to do for us today is talk a little bit about the reforms in the process of higher education in China, which of course, the results of which follow downstream to all of the types of, to, to how res research is carried out, how it's communicated, uh, and, and how the research translates into social contribution. So, um, so Jinshan, you had said earlier, you talked to me earlier about two major goals for Chinese reform. So if we can, um, if you could start off by educating us a little bit about that, please. Okay. Um, thank you for the invitation. Of course, you, you can take the ring check. We will have a dinner or some, yes. or if I can cook it, right? Okay. Oh, great. Um, <laughs> um, the, there are two major um, themes or, or, or major goals of Chinese uh, education reform. Uh, as far as I know, that one is so-called um, jianfu, which means to uh, reduce students' learning burden. Um, this is a quite a good goal, but the way they do it is by reducing those challenging topics, re um, get rid of those hard questions. Mm. Um, any content, um, I will refer to this way, that um, as long as it requires very deep thinking, very creative kind of thinking, then they kind of uh, get rid of those. So this is one way, one goal and the way they do, they, they do it. There is actually another goal, which is uh, in the recent several years becomes more and more pressing and urgent, which is that to um, educate or cultivate more creative people, creative thinker, creative worker, or even to just, um, um, and creative engineers to deal with what we Chinese people call bottleneck technology. And of course, it's beyond that, but that's the, the, like, the, uh, the thing that makes this so urgent. But you can see clearly those two are quite different or actually opposite goals. Yes. One is to redu reduce learning burden. The other is to educate more creative people, more um, problem solving skill, more people seeking for hard questions to solve, right? But those are two <laughs> goals that set up for all the Chinese researchers, um, education management, all related people to do. But then the question is, hey, what we can do now? These things clearly they are not at the same page. Right, no, it's a, that's an inherent contradiction because uh, the hard questions are the ones that lead to creative solutions. Um, 
Now, I, I know that um, at the School of System Science at Beijing Normal University, you've been working on some new approaches to try and resolve this contradiction. Would you mind yes. sharing a little bit about yes. that? Because I think, exactly. I mean, and to the audience, I am aware a bit about this. And um, actually, Jinshan gave me a little test that uh, seeing is believing. And so I, I, I think that this, this has some potential, really real uh, potential traction uh, for, for addressing this issue of enabling creative thinking without overly burdening um, students with, with unnecessary work. So if you would- Great. I will be happy to talk about that. And just remind me that at the end, come back to the issue that how publishers can contribute to that. Oh, I will. I, I promise you, I will remind you. No worries. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Don't, don't let me carry you uh, too far away. Okay, yep. so the main idea we are actually working on now is try, uh, um, let me come back a little bit, step further, sorry, backwards. Say, if people, for people who knows a little bit of physics or have experienced learning physics um, not so bad, you know, kind of reasonable level, then you will notice physics is a very um, different, striking different um, subject with many, uh, from many others. For example, the more advanced the physics you learn, the easier it becomes. This is not from me. This is quoted from Feynman, a great mm -hmm. physicist. So that means that when you learn in the beginning, physics seem to you, there are a lot of results, a lot of measurements, a lot of uh, rules to memorize. But gradually, when you actually build up the whole framework, concept framework of physics, you notice eventually there are only two equations. Of course, the goal of our physicists are now trying to make them to be one, but one. anyway, that's <laughs> another topic, right? Yes. But, at, but, but at least now you're only, it's only two, right? So you're starting from these two central equations combined with several typical ways of thinking, which I will not elaborate furthermore, but, but believe me, there are only a few of them. For example, one of them is called least action principle. Anyway, there are a, a few typical ways of thinking. You combine these two, then you tackle the new world, the whole thing, the whole physics, the results, laws, um, all the things you require to remember when you were in very um, basic level of physics, can naturally be derived or created. Of course, right. that created is like you created on your own, but other people already created it um, already. Yeah. So um, with this experience, I want to make all the fields, not only physics, the learning experience to be something like this as far as possible. Like uh, when you learn, for example, mathematics, if you construct the whole um, concept network, if you um, starting from this concept network, if you extract it further, the typical ways of thinking. And even um, a further step will be like typical ways of thinking in general um, uh, topics without, um, not within the uh, specific knowledge domain. I call general th ways of thinking like creati uh, critical thinking, relational thinking, and the ways of learning, I call meaningful learning, um, towards the big picture of uh, um, each discipline. If, right. you, if you construct the whole um, different hierarchies of concepts, starting from procedural facts, um, not, uh, 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 sorry, factual knowledge and procedural knowledge, and then um, build up the conceptual layer of the knowledge, then build up the typical ways of thinking, then um, towards the general ways of thinking. Then when right. you finish this construction, let's say, assume at last you're already at this top level, the way you need to um, ask questions and solve questions, is like you apply those high level thinking to specific situation. Then you create all the knowledge on your own again. So that's the basic idea. I call it meaningful learning towards advanced, um, knowledge generator. Right, and in, 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 I mean, one way of looking at it is you take advantage of all the learning that's come before to work backwards 
from the most advanced state of learning. So in the case of physics, you have these two fundamental equations that humans have spent centuries trying to get to. So why not take advantage of that and then work backwards, uh, work backwards to understand how you came to understand those equations and derive those equations and then how you can advance beyond it. And for the audience, the example that uh, Professor Wu gave to me, he showed me some structures, uh, some, some images of some old, old buildings, quite ancient, and asked which river did I think that they were located along in China. And now I don't know a great deal about Chinese geography or history, but I was able to guess which two structures went with which, two, which, which of the rivers because one, they, were, they were built for flooding. And all you had to know was that one river was more prone to flooding than another. And in this way, you present, the mo you present where a, a topic has gotten to, be it physics, be it something else, and you work backwards from that and you start to realize you actually do know things rather than, and what this does is this takes this idea of rote learning that has been a problem in Chinese and actually Asian education and to a some extent Western education worldwide and it turns it on its head. You, you start with the answer and work backwards to understand how to ask questions. And I think yeah, it's- I, I, I want to add, um, um, uh, just add one, one thing more that it's not like the factual and the procedural knowledge is no longer important. They are still important. Right. Just that you learn the way to use it, make use of them in problem solving when you learn them. Right. So you like kind of do the thing um, simultaneously and also you, you learn towards those more advanced way of thinking. Right. So there, instead of a burden, right? Some burden yeah. that you have to just learn for the sake of learning, you're, it's a tool that helps you get forward that satisfies your curiosity. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. And from yeah. this experience, you will get more creative, more yeah. um, like uh, happy to see there are problems for you to solve. Um, so this is why I think this is quite exciting and applicable more widely. So uh, let's assume that, uh, that things will progress in China and more people will be adopting this type of approach. What can publishers do to help, help promote this, this, uh, this new paradigm in learning? So in order to do this, we need uh, several infrastructure. For example, we need this hierarchical knowledge network. Right? But who has the resource who can build up from which we can build up the hierarchical knowledge network? Publishers. Yes. Right? You have like a lot of journal papers, a lot of books. There are huge amount of valuable information hidden there. If we can somehow make use of them, right? This is one thing that publisher can do. The other is that, okay, so when next time, if some publisher publish a journal paper or a book, each chapter, they can require the author to write instead of, or besides the abstract, provide also a concept network, right? What kind of concept you're working on? What is the key point there you want to mention? Mm. I just read a book today. It, sees that, it says that when people read something or learn something without understanding the big picture, the goals, people usually get lost, right? right? But there's a concept map. You can clearly see the big picture the goals. We actually have a question on this um, from uh, Frank Norman, who is, uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, uh, uh, in charge of the library at the Francis Crick Uni um, Institute. And he's asking how this relates to problem-based learning. Ah, so um, beside this um, um, knowledge um, hierarchical structure, there are also, I call it uh, a, um, annotated a set of questions. This question can be either homework questions or those uh, you know, projects or problems used in project-based learning. So like for each project, we annotated to um, find out which ability, which ways of thinking, which knowledge is actually required. Then combined with two, with this two, the annotated uh, problem set, and right. the knowledge, hierarchical knowledge network, that's a thing that we want to finally look at. Oh, eventually I will be 
you know, I'm thinking that some, someday we should have something like all the uh, course videos, uh, learning materials, all published, linked to each individual concepts and each individual links between the concepts right. of this network. So the concept- That's my final dream. Right, so presenting information in terms of concept maps would, yeah. be, would, be, um, would not only be critical to enabling this type of, of education, but also would be something that publishers could potentially support. I mean, yeah. any publishers attending this, uh, this uh, session and interested, I mean, I'm sure that uh, Professor Wu, you and your team would be, be interested in, a, in, in collaborative efforts, um, potentially, to see how to render um, so, uh, I'm just looking at some questions here. So, um, one was from uh, Katrina McCallum at Hindawi and she's asking, she's saying students need to learn about, um, the role of failure. Educations and journals focus on success, but how do we teach students to learn from failure? Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> not expert on that, but from my personal experience, let them try let them fail as long as they have guidance nearby, right? Yes. Well, there's a related question to this is, um, which actually comes from Phil, uh, Phil Jones. And he was asking about um, I, all of this, maybe so, this assumes that this, the data will be available. So how important is op open science and also data reproducibility to this type of, of, of education, this approach to education? Yeah, so one of the data or one of this uh, knowledge available, openly available, is that we need them to construct the network, right? So if like uh, all the uh, papers are, are you know, uh, um, there's a, um, a copyright wall, then maybe it's, it will be much harder for us to combine the, what, the, the concept inside of these papers. And then also yeah. another thing is that the research um, data the experience data should also be linked to this um, concept network so that other people, they can learn to recreate. This is the key. Yes, yes. Um, I believe that um, I'm being told we need to wrap up our session, which is, they, it just, they seem too short, they really do. Um, for everybody attending, I will be at the next networking session and I will answer questions and I can channel them back to, um, to Jinshan and uh, I can make introductions if need be, but also I'll try my best to answer questions based on my very limited knowledge. Um, Professor Wu Jinshan, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us. I think that uh, this approach is fascinating and I think, I think the world will really benefit from learning more about it. So I, and I look forward to helping as well. Thank you. So. We are looking forward to work together with publishers and researchers. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, Phil? I believe you are going to introduce the next sessions. So I'm going to hand over to you to do that. And thank you everybody. Excellent. So thank you very much, Nico, and to, uh, and to Jin Shan for, a, for an excellent and very interesting conversation. There were quite a few questions came in um, over, uh, over the various channels. So uh, but please remember that Nico will be available in the Great Hall um, for a while at our next break at 10 minutes past 11. Now, an appeal to everybody, could you please take a moment now to go to your participant survey and fill in the feedback for this session and for previous sessions? You have no idea how important that is to Mark. So, so please do that. Um, next is a pair of presentations uh, on open access books. Uh, this will be starting very soon. To join that, what you need to do is go back to the session, to go back to the timeline and then click on that agenda item and it will magically appear uh, in your browser. So uh, see you there.